Hi, students, welcome to video 18 on terrestrial biodiversity. So before the Industrial Revolution, uh, the primary fuel source was wood. Um, we didn't have fossil fuels yet. And you see now the developing world is facing a shortage of wood and trees, um, which is where we get our wood from, because we are cutting down and deforesting areas so quickly. Um, so in the future, we're going to run into problems with this if we don't correct it right now. So what are some threats to forests? Uh, the main one is deforestation, so that's why I put that one in red. Um, but there's also threats from disease and insects, which is related to tr climate change. So if the temperature gets hotter, then you're going to have more and more diseases and insects. Trees get sick just like people do. Um, and so you can actually have whole forested areas die because of insects that are bearing into their um, roots. Uh, and then you need to know these percentages. So when we say an old growth or a primary forest, we're talking about a forest that has never been touched, basically. It's never been cut down. Uh, and this is 22% of all the forests on Earth. Second, secondary growth forest is going to be something that's been cut and it's been regrown, and that's 74%. And then you have, lastly, your tree plantations. These are often monocultures, like this is a Christmas tree farm up here. Uh, happy holidays. Uh, and this is going to be 4% of what is left of our um, forested areas. And this will be a tree plantation. Uh, the thing that I want you to know here is that it takes about 25 to 30 years to grow a tree for like a monoculture tree plantation. So the idea is you plant things, you know, um, right this second, and then 30 years in the future, you're going to cut them down and use them for fuel wood. Now, when you plant this season's trees, you know, the next season, you're going to want to plant another season's worth of trees. Otherwise, you're going to cut them down and then you're going to have no trees growing, or it's going to take another 25 years to do this. Uh, so it takes a lot of planning to actually get this to work. So you need to be able to talk about ecological value of trees. This is the biggest issue, uh, thing in terms of environmental science with trees. Um, so trees do a lot of different things for us. They stabilize the soil, prevent erosion. Um, basically, the roots dig into the soil. It also slows runoff. It lessens flooding issues and purifies water. And it is a huge storage of carbon for us. Uh, trees also make oxygen. They moderate the climate. Uh, things are just better with trees. And so you see this graph shows you ecosystem services and then how much money that is actually worth. So in other words, if we didn't have trees recycling our nutrients for us, that would cost us $350 billion. Uh, and we would have to try to figure out how to do that ourselves. So it's really important that we don't destroy all the trees because money-wise, it's going to cost a lot of money to do what they do. So looking at some harvesting methods, um, we've talked a little bit about clear cutting, but you also have selective cutting um, and then strip cutting down here. So clear cutting is everything is taken off at once. That's what this picture shows you over here. It's very striking. Uh, selective cutting means you might take out the oldest or certain type. Um, you take out the kind of sickly looking trees. And then strip cutting is you alternate. Um, so I cut in a strip this year. And you'll notice here smaller trees that are regrowing. And then the next season, I'm going to cut in a different strip and I'm going to let these trees grow. Uh, so the biggest issue is with clear cutting, there's going to be way more erosion, uh, way more water pollution, because you have nothing now that is going to keep that soil from going into the water. So it's better to do something like selective cutting or strip cutting. Uh, when we start harvesting trees, we have to basically make highways into areas that have never been. Um, you know, made into highways before. So you start getting things like fragmentation, um, destruction, degradation of habitats. You may even separate species, for example, and cause um, evolution to occur. One species might be over here, the other might be over here. And some um, things that we can do about this, we can sustainably for, um, cut down our trees. So there's something called the Sustainable Forestry Certification. Uh, it looks like this if you buy any paper products or something like that. And it will basically tell you that you are buying a product that has been sustainably forested. Um, there are certain standards for this, places like Home Depot and Lowe's uh, actually have this on their products. And so here's what some of the sustainable forestry methods are. Um, so we would 
uh, identify and protect forest areas high in biodiversity, um, grow more timber on long rotations. So get a couple of these maybe. Stop clear cutting on steep slopes, which causes more runoff. Um, so you don't need to know all of these, but have a few things um, about sustainable forestry to know. So looking at some other things that affect forests, so you have surface fires and crown fires. Um, surface fires are actually really beneficial. You may remember the Smokey the Bear campaign, only you can prevent forest fires, you know. Uh, that's also kind of bad because you want surface fires to burn um, because they add nutrients to the soil, they maintain habitats. Some seeds require fire to germinate, so you need that. And they also control pests, insects, and, and non-native species. So you want surface fires to occur. The problem is if you stop all for surface fires from occurring, then you get a buildup of lots of leaf litter, um, and you end up getting these things called crown fires, which are kind of the more typical forest fires people think of. So a crown fire is the huge ginormous fire where you have whole trees that are burning. It's leaping from crown to crown. This is going to kill a ton of wildlife, cause soil erosion, pollute the air. I mean, these are all the fires you don't want to happen. So if you let those surface fires burn, these will not happen as often. Looking at climate change again, we said that's rising temperatures. You're going to have more diseases and pests because your bugs are going to um, increase in population. You're going to have more fires because you're raising the temperature. And you're going to have more greenhouse gases being emitted into the atmosphere. Why should anybody care about this? Um, well, about two-thirds of the plants that we have ID'd um, as being cancer-fighting chemicals come from forests, particularly tropical rainforests in places like uh, Brazil. Um, and the problem is we're deforesting these areas, we're taking these things down, and we don't even know what they do. So we may be destroying the medicine before we've even discovered it. Um, so looking at rangelands, uh, the biggest problem with rangelands is overgrazing. If you remember Tragedy of the Commons, uh, there's this picture down here of the farmer. Uh, I want to put down another cow because if I don't and I don't let my cows graze, another farmer will. Overgrazing causes grasses to be reduced, increased erosion. The soil actually compacts because you have the cattle basically pressing all over it. You also have plants or cattle plants that cattle will not eat, and eventually it will lead to something called desertification, which is what this picture is showing you down here. Basically, you're becoming more of a desert. So if you allow overgrazing to happen, this is the biggest issue down here that could occur. What can we do? We can ban grazing, or we can say that you can't you know, ride your off-road vehicles in areas. So that's what was done here in this river in Arizona, and this is what it looks like 10 years later. So we know that we can manage it sustainably. Uh, we can do things called nature preserves. We can basically say that here's the area you can't do anything in, and then there's buffer zones kind of going on the outside. You might be able to hunt in buffer zone one. Uh, you might be able to camp, those sorts of things, but you probably can't do anything in the ma main area there. Um, some other solutions to overgrazing, we can rotate our cattle, so take them from one area and move them to another the next season and let that other uh, area kind of grow back. We can also do something called agroforestry, which is we can grow crops and graze cattle in the same area. So you're getting the benefit of the farmer having two things at once, um, like Christmas trees, for example, and having sheep or goats in the area. Uh, so you're not overgrazing, you're not depleting your resources by doing that. Um, so we're going to go through and talk about lands in the United States. So you need to know like what percentage of land is owned by what. Uh, so 60% of land in the United States is privately owned, meaning it's my house or your house or whatever. 29% um, is federal government owns it. 9% is the state and local governments own it. And then there's 2% set aside for Native American tribes, um, reservations where you know they kind of have their own um, laws in some situations. So what I want you to do is make a little table. I believe there are seven things we're going to go through. Um, you need to have the land agency. You'd have managed by who manages it. What can you do there? And then any other thing that you think is important. So the first thing is the national park. So that's the title of it. Um, it is owned by or managed by the National Park Service. 
and the purpose is to protect natural and historic sites. So you cannot hunt, you can't log, you can't mine, but you can go and you can visit. Um, you really can't take anything though. So the idea is to take only photos and leave only footprints. And that was John Murr who said that. Then we have national forests. Um, they're operated by the U.S. Forest Service. That makes sense. Um, and if you remember, uh, Gifford Pinchot told us that we should make forests useful. So the idea here is that you can do all these things. You can hunt, you can mine, you can log, but of course you have to have approval, which also usually comes with paying money to do so. Um, but you can do all of those things in a national forest. A wilderness area is a little bit different, so it is operated by the U.S. Forest Service. Um, it was established in the Wilderness Act of 1964. You can't do anything in a wilderness area. Um, you are not supposed to take anything out. You can't do roads in there, so there's nothing really to drive on. It is supposed to be completely wilderness area. Um, so in other words, nothing human um, has altered it at all. Uh, and about 5% of the United States land is wilderness, and pretty much all of it is in Alaska. You have wildlife refuges. Um, oh, sorry. Um, this is operated by the U.S. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service. Sorry, I was trying to remember what that was for a second. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is what that stands for. Um, originally, there was no hunting, but now you can do that. You can even drill for oil in wildlife refuges. Um, you can't destroy the entire area, but you can still do some things there. And we have National Marine Sanctuaries, all operated by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency. We call that NOAA. You can swim, you can boat, um, you can go for sport fishing, uh, but these things are used to repopulate fish populations, dolphins, marine organisms. And then the main agency that is managing all of this land is the Bureau of Land Management. You may hear it called the BLM. Uh, this is the um, agency that, uh, sorry, um, gives out the permits and leases for government land. So they are going to be the ones telling you that you can go and log in a forest if you pay them to do so. Um, and they basically regulate mining, drilling, all these different things. And then finally, there's an important law. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act was created um, by the EPA in 1969. And what this did was required environmental impact statements, meaning that I first had to go in and show that my development area was not going to destroy a bunch of um, endangered organisms or trees or whatever animals. Um, so I had to do that environmental impact statement first before I could go in and I could do anything. All right, bring your questions.